to share your presentation. Yes, sir. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I conducted a research on sonic branding of luxury fashion houses and consumer perception of the same this year. And my presentation involves my research process and findings on the same. Yeah. Here is an overview of everything that I will be covering in today's presentation. I'm going to start by asking everyone a rhetorical question. We can close our eyes when we don't want to see certain things, but can we stop ourselves from hearing? Even if we did try to close our ears and block a certain sound, it still finds a way to penetrate into our eardrums. Ipsos, a research agency, conducted an analysis which proved that although audio serves better attention, better attention grabbers, it is only used 8% of the times in brand adverts compared to brand colors which stand at a whooping 69%. So while there is a pool of information on the internet regarding sonic branding, it's extremely scattered, invalidated, and very difficult to skim through. And there hasn't been almost any research done on luxury brands and sonic branding in specific. So exploring that aspect through this study would be a first step. The following are the project goals that I seek to achieve through the study. You could just go through it quickly. So here is an overview of what the literature contains of, but in brief, um, a audio or sound or sonic logo or a SOGO is essentially an audio equivalent of a visual logo that can help consumers recognize a brand instantly. And a sonic logo is usually five to 10 seconds in length. And it has been proved that a strong and monotonous rhythm is perceived to be serious and tough, whereas a smoother rhythm is perceived to be as dreamy. So in today's day and age, luxury exists in moments of calm and silence. So while inculcating sonic branding into the luxury segment is extremely important, it's also very essential to know when to pull back. So coming to the methodology, this study is causal in nature because it aims to study the cause and effect relationship between sonic logos and luxury brand perception. Through a deductive approach, the researcher developed hypotheses based on theories related to music, literature related to consumer perception of luxury brands and sound brand matches. The target audience is as follows. You could just go through it. So with the help of a research strategy to test, to test the hypothesis, general observations were made, which led to particular conclusions. Here are the hypotheses that were designed. We'll get into the detail of each while we're when we get into the results of the tests as we move forward. In order to collect primary data, participants were randomly assigned to different manipulations and data was collected to their response through questionnaires and experiments. A two by two factorial design was followed, four possible combinations were designed and each combination was assigned to one group, hence making it a total of four groups. And each group had 75 participants in order to meet the requirement of a two way ANOVA test. A background study was conducted in order to understand how familiar they were with luxury fashion products and their um, other factors such as age, income, education were assessed through multiple choice questions and checkbox questions. Coming to the stimuli, four non-voice stimuli were produced by music producer in Bangalore by mixing the instrument and the beat through permutation and combination. combination. So that's what uh, differentiated the stimuli from one another. And um, these were original sogos. They were originally composed in order to avoid like any preconceived notions or biases. And they were attached with a brand. The brand's name was a pseudonym again to avoid any preconceived notions. And participants were provided with a brief summary on the brand for them to draw possible connections and associations with the sonic logo with ease. The two by two factorial design includes three variables and was then divided into two parts as shown here. In order to measure the relationship between the audio and the brand in question, Acre's brand dimension personalities were used. We used only three for the sake of this study, mainly uh, sophistication, competence, and excitement, because according to a study conducted by Tong X, these were the three personalities that matched that of a luxury brand. Two-way tests on Stata were conducted for the following combinations, as you can see here. 
with the usage of a two way ANOVA test, we compared the results of the means to find out which group is performing the best. And a two way ANOVA test was conducted by the researcher in order to understand if and how the independent variables were interacting with the dependent variables. So, coming to the results of the two way ANOVA test. So as we can see here, the null hypothesis has been rejected since p value is lesser than alpha 0 0.05. Hence, the beat of the audio has a statistically significant bearing on brand recall of a luxury fashion house. And when we compared the mean of the slow beat and fast beat, the slow beat was higher, which proves that the slow beat causes a bigger and better variance. Coming to the instrument, here again, the p value is lesser than alpha. Hence, it causes a variance in brand recall. And when we compared the saxophone and flutes um, mean, we found out that saxophone was higher, hence the saxophone causes a bigger and better variance. And again, as we see here, the interaction of the beat and the instrument causes a variance. So if we combine the results of comparing their means, we can infer that the slow saxophone audio causes a bigger and better variance in terms of brand recall. Coming to audio and brand association, as we can see here, the beat of the audio has a statistically significant bearing on how consumers perceive a luxury fashion house and it positively impacts it. So when we compared the means again, the slow beat causes a bigger and better variance. As we can see here again, the instrument also has a bearing on perception and it's the saxophone which has a bigger and better variance in terms of perception and identification of a luxury fashion house. And while the interaction of both of them is also having a statistically significant bearing on the perception, we can conclude that the slow saxophone, again, in terms of identity and perception, also causes a bigger and better variance. So here are the results of Acres brand personality dimensions comparison. This was done in order to observe the relationship between the personality of the brand and the personality of the audio. And as we can see here, the luxury brand with the past saxophone surprisingly uh, did the best, performed the best. Here is the qualitative data that was collected. As we can see, the respondents are familiar with luxury fashion houses and they have a positive relationship with music. So given that they have a positive relationship with music, fall in the age gap of 35 to 50 years and are high income owners of society, it is safe to say that they had the potential to provide a fair judgment. Uh, and through the two-way ANOVA test, we found that it was a slow beat saxophone that caused a bigger and better variance. And that reinstates the literature which stated that luxury lies in calm and silence and that less is often more. Lastly, coming to the comparison between Acres brand personality dimensions, uh, the fast sacks, which gave the best results, participants mentioned that um, they resonated with this audio because of the instrument used in it and that the saxophone sounded classy. With respect to reliability of the results, the researcher ensured that the questionnaire was approved by industry and subject experts. It was articulated in conjunction with um, proven verticals such as Acres brand dimension personality and the Likert scale, and only globally approved testing methods such as ANOVA were used. And the literature that was uh, studied for this paper was renowned literature and since the researcher herself distributed the questionnaire and participants were assigned randomly to different manipulations, the study was valid and um, it was reliable in the framework of a causal study. The researcher had a number of uh, limitations as follows. So given that the researcher didn't have access to sound branding agencies, um, the stimuli had to be made by a budding producer, hence the quality of the audio could have gotten affected. It was also difficult to assess the attention span, emotional state and general perception towards luxury consumer houses, given that um, the research was conducted online. Since there's a lack of literature, the difference between a jingle and a sonic logo is currently very blur. And because the researcher was located in India, the sample size had to be restricted to 300 people in total and um, given certain time constraints also it wasn't possible to move beyond 300. Um, so the absence of physicality is since the experiments had to be conducted online while they were conducted online the visual impacts were neutralized by keeping it nothing at all but um, if the Experiment were, experiment were to be conducted in person, we would know if 
the participants were genuinely and honestly answering the questions. Going forward, researchers should inspect consumer behavior on a larger spectrum and in a physical and closed environment without any attention diversions. This study only tested consumer perception towards the flute and saxophone, but going forward, a myriad of instruments could be tested as well. And uh, besides the assessment of consumer perception of luxury fashion houses, researchers should also investigate other variables that might result in variance of results, such as respondent surroundings, attention span, memory, mood at the moment, etc. That brings me to an end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Do let me know if there are any questions and I'll be happy to share my email ID. Uh, good work uh, and uh, nice efforts which I have put. Uh, and I believe, uh, like, I said, uh, what, what is this Sonic branding is all about? So, so sorry, I had to skip on the literature because I had to finish the presentation within eight minutes. But mm -hmm. Sonic branding is basically, um, so how McDonald's has ta -da -ta 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 as its logo, that's called a Sonic logo. And even something like Netflix, when, um, when the end sign comes up, the sound that comes along with it, that's a Sonic logo. So basically a Sonic logo is not a visual logo, but it's a sound logo. Oh. And not a lot of brands use it. Very, very few brands use it. And the luxury segment, it's almost, um, you just won't mostly find it anywhere. Got it, got it. Good effort. Sir. So wanted to understand uh, from your study, like uh, what was the, you know, what is the implementation or, you know, conclusion uh, where I can say that, is it the customer perception and uh, branding is uh, proportional? Uh, so the conclusion of the study is that basically my hypothesis has been proved and that a slow audio, a slow beat audio is what matches a luxury brand's personality. And additionally, um, we also found that a Sonic logo does really increase brand recall value of luxury consumer goods. Okay, okay. Sounds good. Uh, nice. Uh, good efforts. and. Thank you. Nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, next, uh, I would like to call upon uh, yeah. uh, Suzela is, is Ismail. Hi, hello. Is, yeah, hello. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Suzela Ismail. Hope you are well. So uh, I'm going to share my slides uh, here now. Yes, please go ahead and restrict right. it to eight Thank minutes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to present uh, my research uh, topic here today, um, collaborating with my uh, co-authors. Um, it's about exploratory factor analysis of religiosity, attitude, and students' intention towards slow repayment. Okay. Um, it's a bit of um, social studies. Um, regarding the loan repayment among students. Okay, um, and we are focusing on undergraduate students uh, in the university. Okay, so basically this is the content for my presentation today. So I'm going to start with uh, introduction. So educational loan repayment is actually um, considered considerable uh, coverage and attention worldwide because um, I'm sorry, I need to stop this. <laughs> um, it's too fast. Um, all right, okay. So, um, actually, educational loan repayment has been um, 
uh, getting a lot of att attention worldwide because um, sorry all right okay which uh, many countries have to deal with it including Malaysia and um, currently um, one of the um, prominent uh, fund corporation in Malaysia it is called National Higher Education Fund uh, has reached nearly double, um, you know, um, in terms of um, the loan repayment um, among the borrowers, the decline of uh, loan repayment among the borrowers. So it's actually um, reached nearly double in the last 10 years. So to understand better in this uh, research topic, so I would like to define uh, religiosity first, which is um, <clears throat> in terms of this um, research study, uh, research topic. So um, we are focusing on uh, Muslim population. Okay, uh, so in the context of religiosity in uh, Islam, it means the level of Islam uh, religious appreciation of an indi individual uh, by monetizing um, And obeying the commands and avoid prohib prohibitions. So, um, <clears throat> religiosity in Islam also uh, means a way of life and practice in daily life. So, um, in other words, um, you are considered a good Muslim if your religiosity, uh, you are highly religious. Okay. <clears throat> and, um, According to the literature, religiosity is also often uh, associated with um, paying uh, obligations or in terms of uh, paying the debt or loan. In terms of um, literature uh, of religiosity and attitude, attitude is um, found to have a very important factor in influencing individuals to repay the loan. However, uh, Shidika suggested that some borrowers also have negative attitude in terms of loan repayment, which is um, some of the borrowers considered loan as a burden. So, this is why um, um, problems, you know, to... Um, Hello? Please continue, please continue. We're able to okay. hear you, please continue. So uh, that is why um, <clears throat> National Higher Education Fund Corporation is having problems in getting, um, you know, the repayment uh, of the loan from the borrowers, okay, because of um, some of the negative attitudes among the borrowers. So, And then uh, we are looking at the um, another variables in this study, which is attitude and intention. So based on theory of reason action, individuals' attitudes also influence intentions that will determine that uh, individual's behavior. So in terms of this study, <clears throat> we are hypothesizing that um, Attitudes might influence the intention to repay loan. So um, we are trying to uh, measure the intention of the uh, borrowers, whether they are going to pay or not. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, sorry, um, the slides keep. Okay. <clears throat> so there is a connection between educational loan repayment also with the intention here. Um, this is the literature uh, for this attitude and intention. So based on theory of written action, um, we are trying to look uh, from the um, variables of religiosity, attitude, and also intention. Um, and uh, the purpose of this study is actually um, focusing on this, uh, based on these factors, based on this, um, sorry, I need to stop this. Uh, 
<clears throat> so focusing on this um, on these three factors, so we are trying to develop an instrument because um, to the best of uh, our knowledge, uh, there is no um, standardized instrument uh, yet uh, in order um, to measure religiosity, attitude, and intention uh, in terms of loan repayment among uh, Muslim population. Suzila can try to you know come to the results and conclusions. I mean, at our least, I mean, uh, try to stick to the time. We have uh, more participants. Right, thank, you. thank you. Okay. So this is a quantitative study um, and involved 150 respondents. Um, so I'm going to share with you um, the results of the study. Um, Okay, basically, um, <clears throat> there are items that have to be removed from the um, questionnaire, okay, which is item number 13 and 14 for uh, attitude instrument. And um, the Chromebook alpha for these uh, three instruments is also found um, very good. The conclusion of the study is um, the exploratory factor analysis for this uh, constructs that has been tested uh, could be measured using several dimensions. Uh, therefore, uh, this set of instruments can be used in um, you know, um, <clears throat> real data because um, this is a pilot study. So, and also, um, it is uh, also. Um, the reliability of and the value of the instrument should put internal consistency to uh, back these uh, results. Okay, so that's all for uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Suzia, for your presentation and uh, sticking to the time and understanding because we have a lot of presentations in pending. All right. Sorry for cutting you in between. So Thank next, uh, I would like to call upon uh, Sridhar Techar. Yes, Do you have Sridhar Techar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Present here. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Um, is my screen visible, sir? No, not yet. Can you reshare re it again? What about us? Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sridhar Thachar, and I'm from um, the National Institute of Engineering, Mysuru, Karnataka. And I'll be doing a presentation on modeling and the motion simulation of vertical load in three axis mechanism. So these are the contents that I will be covering. So basically a model, so what is a model simulation? A model uh, motion simulation is a very effective tool. Use it to control the motion and uh, evaluate a large displacement uh, that is uh, of uh, complex motions of, such as mechanism, tools, and machines that we can see virtually. Uh, it is widely used in uh, many companies, organization, and uh, even also in educational institutions to get uh, better understanding of the performance of the mechanisms and also the joints, links, etc. So the main objective is to study the displacement and speed of the mechanism in vertical axis. Also the distance traveled by the object in leads group for the required time. So for this uh, work, uh, I will be using the Siemens NX uh, software tool, uh, which has a uh, best uh, inter user interference. Interface if we eat. Uh, Siemens NX is a mostly used uh, software for both uh, kinematic uh, solutions uh, simulations. So uh, many engineers, designs, and even students also use these uh, tools uh, to uh, check the virtual virtual simulation of the 
mechanisms. So the um, uh, mechanism design and modeling. Uh, mechanism. What is a mechanism? Yeah, mechanism is a mechanical device uh, which carries force or motion from source to the output. It mainly consists of uh, links and other uh, connect joint to open or close chains. If one link is fixed uh, uh, in them, then it becomes a mechanism. Uh, so the vertical load carry is basically a lead screw mechanism, which converts the rotational motion into translation motion. Uh, it was designed to carry 150 kg uh, uh, load in a vertical direction, that is uh, Z axis. So here are the specifications of the lead screw design. So the third profile is ACK method. And the major diameter is uh, 20 mm, and core diameter is 18, and it is a right hand third. And the uh, number of uh, starters is uh, three, and it's uh, it has a pitch of 4 mm. So this is the uh, model uh, which was uh, uh, modeled in the Siemens uh, using Siemens NX software. Uh, and this is the uh, complete assembly of the three axis uh, mechanism, uh, uh, which we can see in the left side of the figure. And uh, in the, the right side, we can see the load carrier, uh, which is uh, the, which is move vertically in uh, uh, the <coughs> Z axis. So the simulation is carried in uh, Siemens and as I said, the Siemens NX motion analysis uh, software. Uh, so here we study the dynamics of the uh, elements that is uh, on application of the force, uh, how the simulation is. Uh, Carry, how the simulation, how the mechanism works. So we see in this. So we can also see uh, kinematic analysis and also uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, the only difference between um, deals with uh, kinematic deals with uh, motion without forces and uh, dynamic deals with motion with uh, forces. So the also the here the this on uh, simulation is verified with uh, theoretical uh, theoretical calculations. So motion uh, simulation is done in three axes that can move in uh, three linear directions and also provide a rotational motion along with these three axes. So these are the steps uh, that is uh, carried out uh, for motion at least. Uh, first, uh, we define the motion body, and then uh, we create the link between two bodies uh, with the required joint. Then we define the vector magnitude and direction for each element. Then uh, we create uh, the necessary gear couple for this uh, mechanism. Uh, after giving uh, driver joint uh, driver for joint uh, for which motion is required and uh, uh, lastly we define the solution attributes in terms of uh, steps times and gravity time and gravity so here we can see the in left side of the left side image we can see the um, assembly of the mechanism or oh, in the right side i can show you the small uh, clip how the um, motion uh, takes place vertically that is uh, it carries the load as per the uh, pitch, I mean, uh, as per the direction required. So these are the calculation. First, uh, we calculate the torque required to raise the load. Uh, then uh, the, uh, we calculate the torque, uh, torque required to lower the load. Uh, we can see the substantial the difference between those two. And uh, we calculate the lead, uh, that is uh, number of uh, starts uh, multiplied by a pitch. So, so we get the 12 mm of lead. It means uh, for one rotation of leads to the load lifts up to 12 mm. So uh, uh, the solution is obtained after giving the desired values of the velocity and force to, to the joints. Uh, so then the obtained results are plotted in uh, displacement versus uh, time graph in the vertical axis. So then the, uh, these results are compared, compared with the theor uh, theoretical calculations uh, for valuation purpose. So the results, uh, we can conclude that the displacement is uh, 12 mm per uh, rotation. And the velocity obtained is uh, 9.67 mm per second, uh, which we which, and these results is obtained from the simulation. Uh, so uh, the con uh, conclusion is the solution for complex mechanical system can be easily made through motion study in, uh, using that uh, <clears throat> motion simulation software. It gives uh, accurate uh, estimation of the output speed, force, velocity, and other, other parameters. So before manufacturing or before the production, we have to first uh, like uh, simulate what is the required force, what is the required speed, velocity. After that uh, simulation and after that analysis, uh, the further uh, production of the uh, parts is taken place. So in this place, we, ha uh, we have achieved the desired displacement and velocity of lead screw by varying the speed of stepper motor. And uh, this is, these are my references. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, sir. It was a nice presentation. Uh, 
so uh, simulation uh, motion simulation which you did it uh, three axis uh, uh, using uh, katia is it or uh, uh, no sir uh, siemens nx uh, software siemens nx okay 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 the video can you play it once see uh, this is from the side view you can okay. see um, we can see the load of uh, 150 kg is uh, moving vertically up and down mm -hmm. okay okay good effort okay. so uh... yes sir a nice efforts on uh, using uh, you know um, simulation this one so it's into uh, like what exactly um, theoretical calculations and other things have you done like how I is Ah, yes, sir. Here, uh, one second. Okay. I have done the theoretical calculations. So, the torque uh, required to raise the load and uh, the torque required to lower the load. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the lead, uh, the uh, for one rotation, how much the how much distance the load lifts up. It's all calculated, sir. And uh, these uh, calculations are uh, compared with the simulated results from the software. Good efforts. Nice to see, uh, you know, effort which are put towards modeling and uh, especially the, uh, you know, the lead screw movement is. Uh, that's really nice to see that. Uh, so thank you used you, uh, uh, SolidWorks and uh, connections. There you gave uh, motor connections, right? Motor connections and then motor torque. You have uh, put. Hi, ah, yes, sir. So, uh, oh. complete from model to assembly and the uh, simulation is uh, completed and in uh, NX uh, software only. Mm -hmm. In NX only, okay. Yes. Good. Uh, it looks like, uh, like how many parts model it was? Uh, so there are numerous parts. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a uh, base. How, I mean, for a project or like what purpose was this? Uh, sir, actually, I'm uh, currently doing a project in uh, GTRE. Uh, DRD was at Bangalore. Uh, oh. Gas turbines establishment. So they there was an ongoing project to calibrate the nozzle mechanism. Uh -huh. So to calibrate us, so we required a three-axis motion, and I took the um, job of modeling and uh, simulating the three-axis yeah, motions. Thank you, thank you, thank great. you, thank you. So next we'll call upon paper number twelve. That is uh, Huling Huang uh, COVID nineteen predictions using an FX symptom question mining method. Are you here, uh, Yuling man? I... Uh, I'm the presenter. Yeah, please, please share the screen. Uh, nice start. Oh, okay. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leo and I'm today's speaker. I'm pleased to talk about, about our topic, COVID-19 prediction using the efficient symptom question mining method. So since questionnaires on COVID-19 pandemic are becoming increasingly important for measuring COVID-19 cases that were designed to measure the symptoms to which individual a phrase situation in their lives as COVID-19 diagnosis to avoid as much as several waves of infection cases and hospitalization cases identified. Efficient tools to facilitate, facilitate the diagnosis of COVID-19 are needed. In the previous study, the questionnaires are used to vary of COVID. In the previous study, the questionnaire. In the previous study, the questionnaires are used for very of COVID nineteen testing. In by study, it developed machine learning of CT images. In Miller study, it developed ML to accurately predict the death rate of COVID nineteen with the ML. They would identify patients who are at high risk of being hospitalized. Body 
There are previous studies of ways to diagnose COVID-19, such as clinical symptoms, computed tomography stains, and chest X-ray images. The above research proved the ability of COVID-19 diagnosis through ML. Besides, the question sheets are relatively complex and not for the average person to use for self-diagnosis. Therefore, we decided to set up a website to test eight characteristics that users can judge at home. In this study, the data is from Israel Ministry of Health Public Release data. The individuals were tested for SARS-CoV-2 via RT-PCR SA. There are totally eight features. Gender, age, above 60 years old or not. Known con contact with an affected individual. The appearance of five initial clinical symptoms. We hope to analyze the data and come up with a short questionnaire to help self-diagnosis and prevention server for COVID-19. To select the maximum performance classifier, we discriminate the two classes of COVID-19 diagnosis. Besides, we utilize orthogonal was a gonal experimental design to efficiently determine the best combination of feature set and analyze the main effect reveals the individual effect of a feature. Finally, we reached predicting COVID-19 cases with 85.81% training accuracy and 85.87% the test accuracy. This following table is about the data characteristic and the eight features. There are totally 99,232 cases. The negative and positive cases are individually 90,839 cases and 8,393. The eight features are gender, sex, cough, fever, sore throat, shortness of breath, headache, and contact. The data is divided into two blocks the training validation and testing set. The training validation set contains 551,831 individuals. The 4,769 individuals were confirmed having COVID-19. The data were recorded during March 22nd, 2020 to March 31st, 2020. The data sets were further divided to training set and validation set at a ratio of four to one. The training set totally contained 47,401 tested individuals and 3,624 individuals were confirmed having COVID-19. It was recorded during April 1st, 2020 to April 7th, 2020. This is the flow chart of the proposed COVID-19 method. First of all, we seek the data from Israel Ministry of Health publicly released data. Then we separate the data sets. We train the data individually with, a, with the eight mod models, SVM, Rainforest, XG Boot, KNN, Logistic Regression, Decision Trees, Naive Bias, and eight light GBM. In this step, as there are two to 18 eight power, which is 200, 560 experiments. We utilize orthogonal experimental design to select the final 16 experiment. After evaluation, we select the highest performance in eight models and then apply it to build a short questionnaire. You might ask, how do we evaluate the model? The predictive models are evaluated using confusion matrix performance metrics. There are four evaluation criteria, accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and precision. Selecting an optimal number of informative features while maximizing prediction performance is a bi-objective zero or one combina combination optimization problems. An efficient way to study the e effect of several factors simultaneously is to orthogonal experimental design with both orthogonal array and factor analysis. Orthogonal experiment design utilizes properties or of fractional factorial experiments to efficiently determine the best combination of factors levels to use in design problems. The factors are the features in regards as 
selecting levels of the factors. The two level always is described below. Let there be n factors with two level each. The total number of level combination is two to the power of n. For a complete factorial experiment, build an OA, which was two to the power of n minus one with n rows and n minus one columns. Use your first n columns and ignore the other n minus n minus one columns. OA can reduce the number of level combination or factor analysis. The factor of OA combination requires the O analyze O individual factors is only M. The summarized data are analyzed using factor analysis to determine the relative effects of levels of various factors as follows. Let Y T denote a fitness function value of the combination T. To find the main effect of factor i with level k as sik, where i equal 1, 2, and 2n. sik equals sigma yt times wt. t equals 1 to n. The fitness function is to be maximized. Level 1 of factor i makes a better contribution to the fitness functions than level 2 of factors i does when si1 is bigger than si2. This, in this orthogonal experiment design, there are two level orthogonal arrays. The total number of level combination is two to the n power for a complete factorial experiment. In this case, it is 256 for a complete factorial experiment. In our cases, n equals eight. So there means that we will have eight, uh, eight columns and we will have eight columns and M will equal 16, which means we will have 16 rows. The chart contains M rows and M minus one columns. From the formula here, we could calculate the number of M. In our cases, the rank of the combination are in O256 combination. Then we prepare the MED, which is the main effect of features. From that, we could notice the rank of eight features the top one features is contact, and the least effect features is headache. Then we have to decide the feature set. From the chat W, to see that the SI2 of breath is larger than SI1, which means that it is better not to select this feature. However, the however from the final rank of fitness, it is still better to select all features in excluding feature breath. These are the procedures of how we of how we come up with the survey. So first we prepare the independent data sets where each set is used as the training data set of SC of 5 CV. Pre-COVID-19 is step two. Pre-COVID-19 is performed our typical prediction method for each of independent data sets. In this step, R equal eight, use initial of aim equal symptomatic question for each of independent data sets. Choose the maximum prediction performance from the R equal eight classified. C, C, best is, C best is the final chosen classifier with high predicting result. Selecting the feature set with the highest C best predicting performance is according to the feature set combination levels of each experiment in OA. In this study, the first OA experiment design used M equal eight feature numbers for maximizing performance. The performance of eight training model are shown table three. The XG build predictor achieving ACC and AUC are 95.81% and 93.64%. Respectively, XG boost achieve the highest training performance evaluation than the existing classifiers. Therefore, the XGBoost model is selected to carry out the next system development. XGBoost have a better performance than our light GBM. The light GBM predictor achieved score 187.68. We perform 17 experiments of OA. To analyze feature sets, keep the performance of XGBoost classifier on discriminating the two classes of COVID-19 samples. 
The level one of factors and level two of factors mean that the feature is either selected or not selected. Level one means the feature was selected and level two means the feature wasn't selected. In table two, the rank one with the highest fitness values, 189.44, is the best combination of factor levels to use in the design pre-COVID-19. The rank one out of 256 in table two analyzed the feature set with eight factors to select level one. The final test result, ACC, SENSE, XPEC, PRE, and AUC of pre-COVID-19 were 95.87%, 60.40%, 80.69%, 90.8%, and 90.80%, and 90%, respectively. The final training and test sets the model prediction with area under receiver operating characteristic curves with 95%. According to MED, the asymptomatic questions are ranked and their description are shown in table two. The most effective symptom with MED equals 111.52 is question eight, known contact with an individual confirmed to have COVID-19. And the least effective symptoms with MED equals 1.26 is headache. We developed a short symptomatic questionnaire website and it's on your right side and it could help to prevent COVID-19 cases. This method can be applied to effective screening and prevention of COVID-19 pandemic problems. Uh, we come up with some discussions. So first, an optimal set of symp symptomatic question and high performance model are evaluated for predicting COVID-19 case with high accuracy. The met values of sympathetic questions can be more easily estimated the individual effect of sympathetic questions. The proposed, the proposed method pre-COVID-19 achieved a higher test accuracy of 95.87% and AUC of 90% using eight sympathetic questions. The evaluating prediction performance from eight independent classifiers of pre-COVID-19 are very robust from orthogonal experimental design with factor analysis. Understanding the individual effect of symptomatic question and are more effective for predicting COVID-19 cases. We develop a short symptomatic questionnaire website and could help to prevent COVID-19 cases. Pre-COVID-19 is an efficient approach to selecting symptomatic question and attribute classifier. Thus, this method can be also applied to effective screening and prevention the COVID-19 pandemic problems. And this is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation. It was a nice efforts which are put towards uh, the queries and all. Thank you.